We'll disconnect. Need to get my audio ready. So I've got my selected mute button. Ooh. Okay. Let me know when I can do my countdown. Okay. I uh, need to pull up our stream real quick. Make sure we've got good audio levels. Take about another 30 seconds. Okay. Twitch. It just takes forever to get through the system. It's... I'm gonna check this again. It's been two minutes. It's been two whole minutes. It should be live. Where on Twitch? Yeah. Let's see. <coughs> uh, I'm live on Twitch. I okay. see us on Twitch. So, I mean, you want to refresh? Uh, we're live. I think we're live on Twitch. I see us. Yeah, we are definitely yeah. live. Okay. Um, mm, this is odd to me. I'll upgrade YouTube DL real quick. So I literally just made changes this month. Okay. One password to support U2F security keys. As we speak. But we knew that. Nice. But LastPass is already doing that. Right? Uh, LastPass does not have U2F support. Oh, they just have YubiKey support. Yep. So that must mean like last pass is going to be soon. Just, yeah, I uh, would really yeah. hope so. Okay. okay. Um, I am ready when you are. And then I heard the tight the the new USB C Titan security key from Google. I think is actually branded from YubiKey. Interesting. Okay. I I don't have the source for that. I don't have my citation, but mm -hmm. I think. Yubico, Yubico, Yubico tweeted that out. But anyway, okay. Hmm. Uh, 224. So, oh, are you ready? Yep. Okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 224 of the Security Podcast here on the In30 Network. Mm -hmm. I'm Haim Cohen. Tom is right there. Tom's ear is next to him. I am. But, I'm indeed right here. I mean, it's been a few weeks. It seems like this uh, Twitch stream to YouTube and Tom Zier master computer seems to be working out for now. It's been simple to set up. I offloaded the hard work to Tom. But either way, it's been working until something else happens. So we're hoping something else in the positive direction happens. Like Google says, oh, guys, we're sorry. Uh, here's Hangouts back and we can just do it. So... Oh, that would be magical and and really like i'm i do this often enough and i run enough podcasts like this that i am perfectly fine paying for a product like if you want to go out and start a company that is hangouts on air and you want me to pay you like anywhere from two to five dollars a month for that privilege 
please, by all means, I will throw money at my monitor right now. Probably not the coins. Probably just paper. Or plastic. Well, how about some uh, Dogecoin? I, I will definitely Dogecoin? throw... I, I will definitely throw some Dogecoin at that project. So, well, I want... Talking about uh, giving, uh, giving some props to somebody coming up with a good idea. So if you go to the website, Adversarial Fashion, don't ask me to spell it, but adversarialfashion.com, we'll put in the show notes. Um, the person who did this spoke at DEF CON and she has um, one of those Halloween Twitter names. So I don't, I, I know her name is Kate, but that's about it. Kate Rose, she spoke at DEF CON in the Crypto Village. She made license plate thwart, thwarter t-shirts. So she came to DEF CON with this, I'm not going to say that it looks pretty, but with all these license plates on it. And basically her talk was about how the the, uh, the Android, uh, not the Android, the police license plate readers will take this and you inject junk data into their system, thwarting the, the, the license plate scanners and, and uh, hopefully making their life a lot harder. Uh, this is, this is fantastic. Um, and it really, it's the epitome of the hacker culture, right? It is, mm -hmm. it is causing mischief. It is the intersection and use of technology in ways that really no one should really ever think of or, or implement. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, and I am definitely going to be picking one of these up. Not that I necessarily encounter that I know of uh, any like license plate readers while I'm milling around Seattle, but just in case... Yeah, it'd be a good thing. And at the absolute worst that comes out of this, it becomes a talking point. Look, uh, I mean, I'm not going to wear... They are not pretty. I mean, I, I will I will say this, but I think I'm going to pick one up, hopefully get it in time for Halloween. There'd be a good costume. Um, she wore it all over DEF CON, which was good, and people definitely asked her. And, and like I said, it's basically it's just a whole bunch of license plates. The one I want is the one with the Fourth Amendment on it. So all the license, but, but it's like I said, it's uh, it's not the the prettiest there. The other one with some circuits in there, and the idea is is just to inject junk data that somebody has to now parse through, and the goal is to screw up the license plate readers, which it looks like is completely legal. I mean, obviously there's no disclaimer on this, but you could wear whatever you want. It is a free country, so yeah. I, I wonder if we're going to start seeing laws like with automated data collection systems, are, are there going to be like anti mischief laws? Like you're not allowed to willingly poison somebody's data collection efforts or, or something like that. Look, uh, whatever it's all I know. So the first there is that one. Then we, we did talk about the story, the juggalos from insane clown posse that makeup apparently also stopped the face recognition. Yeah. Now that that's a bridge too far for me. I'm, I'm not going to uh, wear ICP or, or uh, yeah. juggalo face paint just to defeat some facial recognition software. Maybe I'll wear like a cool cyberpunk gas mask and goggles, but not, not juggalo face paint that's just no nah. and then she talks about also other ways to do it with with um with like like prints like poster prints that you put on your shirt or whatever it is but the, it is open source so if you want to make your own t-shirt design using all these open source projects you can but that's going to be a definite labor of love so pay her whatever i think they want $36 for a t-shirt, something like that. I think it's worth it. So hopefully for Halloween, maybe Tom and I will get it and we will do a show with it on. So we can and then... It's, uh, yeah. it's for a good cause. So It's, it's all in the name of, of uh, Hacker Mischief. So... So that was our big, that was our quick, like my little plug there. The other story we didn't get to last week was... Um, Twitter handle is digital lawyer. Basically, he went, he gave a 20 or so Twitter thread um, tweet of uh, of how he was almost fished by the bank, not by the bank, by hackers pretending to be the bank. And, and basically what it's saying is that they've gotten really good. Um, 
So it starts out one. This is your bank. Uh, we want to use your, uh, did you use your card in Miami? Okay. Yes, that, that happens. We noticed some fraudulent transaction. Was this you? And then he says, no. And then they start saying, okay, we need to do some verification checks. Okay. Can you verify who you are? I guess that's the next best thing that you would hope for. And, uh, read some transactions. So he read, they read some transactions. He agrees to it, keeps on going, um, and asks for a pin. And that's when finally he said that, wait a second, I'm not giving my pin. Uh, you're not getting it. And then basically they talk, say, well, we can't help you. We can't stop this fraudulent transaction. So there's that thing that, wait a second, somebody's buying something on my card that I'm going to have to deal with. And the bank's calling me, but they want my pin for verification. And and the good thing is you realize, hey, I should stop and then do what Tom's going to suggest in a second and go back through and keep on going. And it turns around that, they, that they're that they asking all these questions just to get the pin. So they came up with this likely scenario and they were looking for the pin and the name and they had the address and that was enough for them. But the good thing is he did not get hacked, but it was just basically perfect English, perfect questions. And the only the only... The thing was, what's your pin? And that's what got him, what almost got him. Yeah. So to to give a little bit more background, like how how were these people reading off transactions, like legitimate transactions from his bank account? Uh, it turns out because of a password reset workflow, one of the you know things we talk about a lot that happens to be uh, you know one of the weaker links in your cybersecurity armor. Uh, so he gets this call. And it's you know. Hey, we noticed some fraud in your card. Um, can you, you know, tell us who you are, verify it, what's your member number? He gives them the, the member number because generally, um, if there's like a member number or an ID number, they shouldn't be used for any kind of authentication purposes. Um, and uh, the, the person on the other end who's purporting to be the bank um, says, okay, we've sent a verification number to your phone. Um, can you go ahead and read that back to me just so I can confirm that, you know, I know it is you I'm talking to, which seems like a smart authentication strategy, right? Until you realize that the pin that they sent was actually the, the fraudster on the other line, clicking reset password, typing in the member number, and then typing in the one-time code sent to their phone. So by asking for that over the phone, they're able to get to the password reset, set a new password and log into the bank's, um, you know, the e-banking site. Um, so then they're logged in as the customer and they can see and read all of the transaction history. Now, luckily, uh, this bank did say, OK, if you want to transfer any money outside of this account, you have to use the pin number. So that's why they were trying to go after the pin so they could just send money away. Um, so I will fully admit I have absolutely responded to these calls when they came in calling me directly. Uh, it's not right. It's not a good thing. Uh, and it's definitely unsafe behavior. Uh, and I am, I am changing my way. So just so, you know, our listeners out there don't think that we're like security gods and we do everything perfectly all the time. Like we are just as susceptible as every other human out there on the planet. Right. Um, you know, I, I do not do security things in a perfect way. Uh, I, I never have. Um, and you know, there's a lot of risk reward trade-off with that. A lot of, you know, uh, convenience, uh, risk trade-off with that too. Um, so what you should do is if somebody, if somebody calls reporting to be from the, uh, the bank and they say, Hey, we need you to go through some identification for us so we can, you know, uh, make sure that these fraudulent charges don't go through. You pull out, you pull out your credit card, and by credit card on the video, I'm showing my buy ten coffees get one free card, which I'm about halfway through, so I'm pretty excited about that. But you should you should turn this bad boy over, and uh, and look on the back. You'll see a phone number on the back of your credit or debit card. Call that instead. Tell the person on the other end, like don't don't be rude about it. Don't assume that they're a fraudster because chances are they're not. But say hey. Just to be more secure, I'm going to hang up and I'm going to call the number on the back of my card. If it is a legitimate bank, if it is a legitimate credit union, if it is a legitimate institution at all, they will say, I completely understand. Thank you. Have a good day. 
if they are not, they will fight tooth and nail to keep you on that line, and that's when you should hang up immediately. Right? Don't be rude right off the bat, but just explain that you're going to call the number on the back of the card. Uh, and when you do that, go to the fraud department, speak to a human, go through you know whatever kind of verification that they want to go through or uh, you know transaction validation, um, and they'll be able to take care of it then. But just remember, the number's on the back of your card. Use it. Don't do the other mistake that people do where you say, okay, what's your phone number? I'm going to call you. That's another thing that was out there. And it, and it was one of those initial thoughts that that was a good idea. Uh, what's your phone number? Let me call you right back to verify because they're just going to give you their phone number. Just have to remember that. It's Yeah. We've also seen uh, fraud where somebody has actually gone through and put either fake or... Um, stolen uh, Google Maps identities for certain banks in the area. So if somebody went and looked up a bank's phone number on Google Maps, not saying it's always going to happen this way, but just know that it's not as official and it's definitely not as secure as looking on the back of that card and grab the number from there. Because it is one thing to change a phone number in Google Maps for a bank. Uh, it is something entirely different if they somehow put their phone number on the back of your credit card. Now, if they do, they probably deserve the money that they're going to steal from you. Like that, that is a level of effort so far out there that there has to be a reward of some kind. So a former host on the N30 network who has a two one got a 212 Google voice number and got the postcard for Google Maps to say an office on the Empire State Building. So he has he has an an office on the Empire State Building with the corresponding 212 area code. So it can be done, but like you said, if it's if they're getting in the back of your credit card, like that's how they're doing it, there it's not a simple map search. That it's an impressive hack at that point. Because I was trying to get the crypto village on the on on Google Maps in uh, Planet Hollywood for DEF CON. And, and we're two weeks out and they're like, yeah, they're not going to do it for you. So, and it's like, it was for a good cause too. And they wouldn't do that. But it can, look, these frauds only get these, the phishing attempts are only getting better. So you just have to, you just have to listen. Think of your gut. Who is calling me? My wife on her on the, her real estate transactions has do not wire money unless we tell you unless we t not through email we will call you and we will be on the phone with you while you do it basically that's what like that's like the disclaimer in the email big letters do not wire money unless we fit we actually call you and tell you or you call us or whatever it is and in kind of a, a little bit related um, if. A government office demands payment in cryptocurrency of any form or in <laughs> um, Apple or Google Play gift cards or prepaid Visa gift cards. It is it is 100 percent a scam. Do not fall for it. Um, the federal government will contact you through uh, the United States postal system and they usually demand checks. Usually. Or you can go to your local federal office, which there are a lot of. You'd be surprised how many little federal offices there are around there. So security yep. administration, um, uh, IRS, all these things. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of tax offices. You'd be surprised how many there are. So, yeah, so uh, you know, don't don't respond to anyone asking you for uh, iTunes gift cards because. Uh, it's it's not legitimate unless unless it's Apple asking you for iTunes gift cards, um, and it's usually because you're trying to buy something, right? So, well, let's talk to our main story. So, after last week's news bonanza, there was not too much news this week, I guess, because it all came out last week, and we're we're sitting here thinking for a topic. And we're talking, and I guess the topic of backing up comes in. That that topic always comes up. Is there a better way to back up? What should we be doing with backing up? And we're not necessarily just speaking about ransomware or anything like that. We're just talking about how to keep either files synced or backed up. And we've hit upon this a lot, but but I guess we just wanted to just another, just let's hit it again with like the best ways type thing to back up. Now there are new services and everything else. So I'm gonna let Tom start because he has a lot more experience than my like one little thing that I do. Uh, so if you are, if you are, you know, generally technically inclined, if, if you're a computer nerd, 
especially if you're a hacker, if you like the command line, if you like wiring stuff up yourself, um, I can, I, I've been using this for a few months now and I can totally 100% recommend uh, Restic. Restic is a free open source application. You throw it on your computer and you can hook it up to an insane amount of data storage backends, whether it's just a folder somewhere on an external drive or uh, anything from uh, Amazon S3 to uh, Azure, like file storage to uh, Google Drive to Dropbox. To, I mean, you name it, they support it. If you want to throw stuff over like rsync into like some weird server somewhere just plain old ftp restic supports it so if you are inclined in wiring up a backup solution yourself and you don't mind paying for the storage that you use or you've got a separate system somewhere i actually used to keep a netbook at a buddy's house just to handle backups uh, i can fully recommend restic uh, it is very fast it is secure they do encrypted snapshot backups and I've gotten stuff back from it already. So now, 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 Tom says if you're good with the command line, you have to be really good with the command line, and there's no other option other than command line. Yeah, there, there is no GUI to this whatsoever. Like it is straight up a command line application. Like for my scheduled backups, I scheduled them with cron. If you yeah. don't know what that means, you should not use Restic. <laughs> So, so for those who have kids and have have stuff to do and have a job, uh, let's talk about a little more simple things. So we we've ran the gamut of this, and I it it you know what it just it comes back to, you know what something very simple like Dropbox or Google Drive or OneDrive or any of these free platforms, and we'll talk about why they're good and bad in a few minutes. But for me, it's it's my wife uses Dropbox. I use Google Drive mainly because I'm cheap. And I've just found out that for me, Dropbox just works. When I'm doing stuff with my wife, uh, files back with my wife, it, they just work. Google Drive works, but their file sync is a dumpster fire on uh, at least Mac OS. I, I mean, I it, this dumpster fire uh, insults dumpster fires. Like this is like the worst of the dumpster fires. If dumpster fires could be a dumpster with more fire, that's how bad it would be. But it's pretty well, bad. It, it's it yeah, it is awful. And and so, but if you're just doing it for files, it's okay. It's tolerable. Dropbox is so much in my mind, so much better. I've been using OneDrive at work. It works. I guess like yes, it works. I mean that's what it is. Using it with Outlook works better. There's still a lot of a lot of little commands that I don't understand. But any one of these, whether it's Dropbox, Google Drive, iCloud, if you want to use, if you want to pay Apple for iCloud, um, uh, let's all these other ones. They're good. They're commercial. They're not necessarily encrypted, but you know what? They're for what most people are doing. They're fine. Uh, yeah, there there is a um, encrypted style Dropbox application that I used for a while uh, called Spider Oak. Um, the last time I used it, and granted, it is it has been at least three years since I've looked at this product, so I'm probably way out of date, but it wasn't the easiest thing to learn how to use, and it definitely wasn't the easiest thing to use. It worked, uh, but it's not as fire and forget as Dropbox, uh, not by a long shot. And, and frankly, if what you're backing up is, you know, that just photos and normal documents and stuff that like don't don't throw your cryptocurrency wallets in Dropbox unless you accept that risk, right? Um, but for just normal files and stuff, you just don't want to get lost if your computer, you know, quite literally catches fire and explodes one day. Dropbox is fine. It it totally works. Now the thing to keep in mind is that Dropbox, Google Drive, Spider Oak, all of these things they will only protect the files that you throw into that bucket, right? So if if you're storing your family photos in C photos and you are not like copying that over to Dropbox and your computer blows up, it's gone. Dropbox doesn't magically take an image of your computer. That's not how it works. It will store the things that you throw in it and it does that relatively well. Um, so yeah, if, if you're just looking for a file level backup, uh, or it, at the very least, just file level replication, just having it in more than one place. Dropbox is fine. It, it, Dropbox is pricey. They want, this is, their business model really does bug me. 
compared to Google Drives or even iClouds, they want $100 a year for two terabytes. And it's one of those who needs two terabytes and I get what they're trying to do. They don't want you to think about it. They probably want you to put your entire drive in there so you don't have to worry about it. But you know what? I need a hundred gigs. Like that's what I need. I don't need, I don't need two terabytes. I need about a hundred gigs. Uh, Google Drive has that option. 100 gigs is $20 a year, which for me is very manageable. You can do your Google surveys and get 20 bucks a year. Um, iCloud apparently got reasonable recently around, same thing, I, I'm, while Tom's talking, I'm gonna go look it up, but basically it's it's uh, iCloud, what they want you to do is store your entire iPhone and your Mac on there, which does get pricey. But like you said, if you're just putting some files on there, uh, the photos, everything else, it's, I, I'm going to say, pick the one that you like. The, any of the commercial products are fine and learn how to use it. Selective sync is awesome where you can say, hey, I don't need all these folders. Put that in the cloud, but on my computer, this is what I want. And the good thing is that means when you're starting to buy laptops, you don't need to buy laptops with these huge hard drives unless you're uh, a digital hoarder because it's in the cloud. Like my iMac has 256 gigs, which is probably in the low end, but hey, I'm nowhere near running out because everything well, is stored on my server, but same idea. Yeah, iCloud also has, uh, and a lot of the products are now getting these uh, family style plans, right? They they took a page out of the, the Spotify and Netflix playbooks, right? Where you can pay a, a little bit more so people have their own logins, but you're generally pooling and sharing the storage space. So um, if you have, you know, a bunch of iPhones uh, hooked together in a family plan, iCloud actually isn't a bad deal. Um, you know, is it is it perfect? Does it work everywhere? No, no. Like most Apple products, it's going to work best inside of their ecosystem. Uh, but, you know, if you're just looking to keep your iPhones, iPads and I other things backed up, iCloud's great. Look, if you have a Mac and it's uh, you have a Mac, it's probably and you're on Macs and iPhones and everything else, you're probably doing fine. Uh, 50 gigs is a dollar a month. So 12 bucks a year for 50 gigs. You can't complain about that. Two yeah, terabytes is, is $10 a month, which goes right in line with uh, Dropbox's cost. So, I mean, in the past, iCloud storage space was ridiculously expensive. They seem to come down. Google Drive or Google, whatever they call it, Google One and then Drive, whatever it is, they're also very reasonable. I think my, if you have Office 365, I have unlimited on Office 365, but that's because I'm a educational plan, not a paid plan. But I think it's the same idea. So one thing that I'm going to recommend against uh, and, and it's I want to say it's rare for us to like act absolutely blast products um here on this show uh but i can completely recommend against own cloud and next cloud the own cloud fork uh simply because their sync model is subpar uh it works technically uh but not very well uh but the things they promise as far as security and encryption uh, are absolutely lacking um, underneath the hood and, and it's an open source product they're getting better right i don't want to blast any individual developers but the product as it stands today i uh, is just I, I would consider it completely untrustworthy um, i i would not put your data in there and i would not trust it with your data at all uh, if you are using own cloud or next cloud find something else to move off of uh, or to move on to. Um, I, I know it's convenient as a lot of features. I used to be an own cloud user back in the day, but um, after reading through the source code and looking through the GitHub issues, it, there leaves a lot to be desired there. It's um, not something you want to depend on. I mean, you're getting into, or you're, you're jumping ahead now to, okay, so you don't want any of these things and you want to basically roll your own, which is also not a bad idea. So I have the problem. Um, I have a side, I have a side hustle. I guess that's what the youngins are calling it now, where we need to keep one folder completely synchronized. We don't use it, but we need to have access to it for one to verify, to verify that we've done something. The problem is this folder is getting to be 19 gigs, 20 gigs. And nobody needs it on their computer, but we have to have access to it. So, so the problem is Dropbox fills up. So the five of us now need to pay $100 a year just for this one folder, 
or we can do one Dropbox account and log in with the web, which is, it's not fraud, but it's not the best idea where we all have this one login. Uh, we could all move to Google Drive, but and it's like, I have a server. Why don't we just put it on my server? And then, then the idea came in and I haven't remembered this thing, but sync thing was was thrown out. Basically, you download SyncThing, it's an app, you run it on your computer, you tell it which folder to sync, just like Dropbox, and anyone who runs that and you 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 authenticate against yourself, you put the code in, the, the workgroup code, it will sync that one file, that one folder for you across everything. And, and while it's not as simple as Dropbox or Google Drive or OneDrive, it works very well. And it's, and at least the transfer, I think the, the transfer is encrypted. So yeah. I think so. The transfer yep. is encrypted. I think Dropbox and Google Drive also the transfer is encrypted. They're uh, they're using yeah. SSL with yeah. with Sync thing. They do have uh, people donating server resources mm. as kind of relay points. But when they accept the transfer, like even before it leaves your machine, it's actually end to end encrypted there on your machine. So when it goes to a relay point, even if they you know, are inspecting all the traffic and just grabbing it before they send it off and doing some analysis, they can't actually get to your data. Um, I use sync thing every single day. Um, you can pick one folder, you can pick 100 folders. Uh, you can pick one machine, you can pick 10,000 machines. Uh, SyncThing just figures out the right thing to do. And they have versioning built in that you can toggle on and off per folder. So if you know that something you know, has a chance of getting hit by malware or ransomware or something like that, and you want to make sure that you've just got you know, a couple copies laying around. Uh, it will do versioning. It's it's not going to be perfect, right? Like malware could absolutely destroy the sync thing versions. Um, but uh, if you've got multiple versions and multiple computers and those computers are being backed up with another system, uh, you know, you've just increased your chances. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that synchronization is not backup. Uh, it's replication, but it's not necessarily backup. For a true backup solution, you want to look for something that has got snapshot level backups. So you can pick a point in time and say, I want all my data as it was on this date, or I want this one file as it was two weeks ago. Uh, and the system should let you get that back. And for me, it's the, the problem is, like I said, we need something really simple. And, and like we said, you either pay for it or you roll it yourself. And for me, it's, I need files that are backed up. So I have a hard drive, I put it in, I back it up. I have a server also, it, everything backs up to there. It's redundant, so I have a, <clears throat> I have four hard drive. I have it in RAID 1.0, so I have one fit. I have four hard drives and I can lose one. It's not, it's not exactly, but close enough. So I can lose one drive and, and everything is still there, rebuilds it. And yes, I give up drive space for that. Uh, but little thing, little things, it's like this, like I said, this one folder that I need synced. This is like the perfect thing, idea, sync thing, because it goes back and forth. And then every year I take it and I actually back it up. So it's not necessarily, like you said, versioning, but it's there. Everyone can have it. It synchronizes it. So if one computer goes down, I guess if the other person, let's say, is away, they would still have it. So if my hard drive crashed, sync thing wouldn't go and say, oops, it's crashed. We're going to delete everything. It's not going to synchronize right. it that way because that's always my problem. When I delete something, I, I want to delete it from my computer. I don't want it there. And in sync thing and all these, they have they have actual legitimate questions to say what happens when this happens. So yeah. on my Synology, I have that where one of the Synology built-in apps will say, we'll go to all your cloud storage devices, uh, your cloud storage services, and we will pull all that off and we will store it in whatever folder they want to call it as sort of backup. And they will say, how do you want us to sync it? If it's deleted off there, do you want it delete off the Synology? Or if you delete it off, uh, or do you want to make a new version of it and all this other stuff? So, so that also works out well. Uh, one of the nerdy things that I use sync thing for is uh, for some classic PC games, um, they don't have a cloud save system. Like they're not on scene. They're just installed through disks. It's it's weird, but I mean, I says now, but yeah. Um, what I do, because I'm on a lot of different computers and I want to play some of these old games no matter where I'm at, I use sync thing uh, to synchronize the save game folder for those classic games. So no matter what computer I'm on, as long as I've got the game installed, I can pick up 
like old school Baldur's Gate, uh, you know, save files, no matter what computer I'm on, no matter whose house I'm at, as long as I've got sync thing installed in my user account there and the game ready, I can play and pick up my game wherever I'm at. So if you, if you dreamed of doing stuff like that, sync thing might be the tool for you. Well, I've just looked at the clock and we're like, whoa, way over time, but let's just, let's just wrap it all up. So we talked about backup. You want to back up something? Uh, we didn't talk about like the the full store, full computer things. It's for a different day. But if you want to back up a bunch of files, whatever it is, Dropbox, the commercial ones, Google Drive, iCloud, OneDrive, uh, all those are fine. If you want something more, uh, I was saying sync, sync thing, or we didn't talk about BitTorrent sync, but I would probably we haven't looked at it that hard, but it's probably okay. I'd recommend against it, mostly okay. because sync, sync thing kind of fills mm -hmm. in exactly where that left off. And it's okay. just better. And it's open source. That, that's that's the key. Or if you really want to roll your sleeves up, which I don't want to do, Tom has his suggestion, Rustic. So, I really do the, love Rustic. I mean, again, you have to try and get your significant other and your kids and everyone else to like, oh, just type these commands if you want it, but... If it works for you, it works for you. So I still want a jungle to solution where I just pointed at an AWS instance and just be done with it. But again, I'm lazy. I'd rather pay for it to look pretty. Anyway, maybe next week we'll continue with, uh, okay, what to do now that it's in the cloud or you want to get it off the cloud, different things like that, because now it's on the internet and what do you do with that? But anyway, let's end it. We're way over and uh, I don't think we'll see you next week, but the week after. Join the WhatsApp group. Yes, find us. We'll we'll get you in. Anyway, have a good, have a good rest of the week. Bye, everyone. See you, everyone. Okay, I have stopped. I'm going to stop our recording here in just a second. Yeah, I literally.